Hello, this is Scott Jens. Welcome to Sandbox Stories. Hello, welcome to this Sandbox Story, which is an interview with Dr. Dora Carlson. She's an optometry practice owner, a leadership coach and motivational speaker, an aspiring master gardener, and much more. She's also been deeply involved in optometry volunteerism, which culminated in her installation as president of the American Optometric Association. We have a lot to talk about. Dr. Carlson, welcome to Sandbox Stories. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Always fun to visit with you. Yeah, you too. I want to start with this intriguing aspiration of Master Gardener. What does that even mean? <laughs> um, well, you know where that started with when you asked me that question about what I was into lately is, so I'll tell this story, is a friend of mine is a dentist. And she went to a conference earlier this year, and there's a dentist going around talking to colleagues about burnout and how to... Um, Make sure that you don't burn out as a dentist. And then, you know, at the same time, I see all this stuff posted on social media in our forums about feeling burnt out. And then Medscape, I get a daily email from Medscape, and it was talking about the health professions that have the highest rate of burnout. And, you know, so obviously it's a hot topic at the moment. So I was talking with my dentist friend, and I said, So what was recommended? And the comment was made that what we can do to do things besides our profession that feed us emotionally, physically, you know, feed the other parts of the brain other than in our case, just being optometrists. So what else do you do? Um, and we, we know people who don't have hobbies, right? I can name a few people that don't have hobbies and they, they willingly admit that. So it became our joke between my husband and I and my dentist friend and her husband that we should create business cards that are business cards that don't have optometry or dentistry on it at all. And, you know, what would we put on our business cards? And we joke because my husband has a plethora of hobbies. In fact, he told me that I couldn't retire because I had to pay for his hobbies because his hobbies are really expensive hobbies. And so I thought, okay, what would I put on my business card? And so it was reader, writer, author, aspiring master gardener. I love gardening. Um, so, and there is such a thing as being a master gardener and I'm not at that level, but that would be pretty cool. Uh, so, you know, it's the things that you can add to it. I'm a cocktail waitress because same dentist and lawyer husband opened a speakeasy and it's only open on Thursday evenings. So, um, yeah, that's a whole other, another story. <laughs> so anyway, it's like, what can you add to your business card that, if you had one that would be something besides your profession that earns you your most income. So that's what it's about. Right. You've been at optometry a long time. Does gardening actually give you that feeling of rebooing yourself and, and oh. staving off burnout? Yeah. I mean, it's digging in the dirt. It's hauling bark mulch. It's, you know, things that you wouldn't be doing necessarily. Plus it's a good workout and it's, I joked, and my boys know this because it's been since the day they were born, never buy me gifts for Mother's Day. Never. I don't want a gift. Just take me to a greenhouse. Okay. I love it. Well, I, tell us about your family. I know you're very proud of your two sons. Yeah, they're doing well. Um, you know, considering that Seth went to his first board meeting for the NDOA when he was five weeks old, I mean, they certainly grew up in optometry. And neither one of them are optometrists. So at this point, um, both have graduated from college. Our older son lives in the Destin, Florida area, and he is an electrical engineer. And he works for a small company of 40 people that kind of subcontracts out with the Raytheons of the world and mostly does Department of Defense contracts. So I asked him, and he has this low level security clearance. I asked him, so can you tell me what you're working on? And mostly it seems to be motherboards for missiles. Okay. So, you know, his brain thinks a little bit differently than mine does. So, and then our younger son graduated. If you asked him a year ago what his dream job would be, 
he would have told you that he really wants to be an FBI agent. And actually, that's been his dream job since about seventh grade. And then he graduated from college and realized that FBI, Secret Service, Department of Justice all turned him down because he had no experience. How do you get experience? So he spent nine months living with his brother in Florida. And ultimately, um, beginning of January, he joined the Army. And so, the, and of course, he wants to be special ops. Of course. Of course he does. So he is, the path to get there is to become a military police. So we went to his graduation from his first five, five months of training a couple of weeks ago. And now he is learning to, he's in airborne school right now. Second week of three weeks of training. And so I said, Ian, so airborne, that's perfectly healthy individuals jumping out of perfectly working airplanes, correct? And he's like, yeah, mom, that's what airborne is. So um, he's in his second week and he said he's having a ball. So oh, bless him. That's yeah. wonderful. I'd like to shift to the story of how you met your husband, Dr. Mark Helgeson, and how you ended up starting a practice in North Dakota. Uh, that's near the Arctic Circle, isn't it? Uh, sure. Sure. <laughs> we like, we prefer to call it Baja, Manitoba, because it sounds warmer. So, <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. You know, so sounds warm, warmer, right? Um. So I grew up, ironically, I grew up 20 miles from the Canadian border in Minnesota. And my husband grew up in North Dakota. We went to undergrad five miles from each other, maybe three, somewhere in that ballpark. We never met there. And so we kind of joke that sometimes we were at the same concert or, you know, same places, but, you know, our paths just never crossed when we were in, living in the same city. And fast forward, I ended up going to optometry school out in Oregon and I was, um, we were at a function and one of my classmates was from Minnesota actually not that far from here. And so this guy is talking to one of my classmates and I overheard him say, yeah, I went home to Grand Forks for Christmas. And I stopped and I said, North Dakota. And he said, yeah. And I said, I grew up like an hour from there. And he said, well, my folks live there. After he graduated from high school, his dad got transferred with a phone company and ended up moving closer to where I live. And so our parents lived an hour away from each other. So we joke that we went a really long ways from home to basically meet somebody from home. So we both did residencies. Uh, we were in the Seattle VA system for our residencies. And um, Mark had found some jobs. He was a year ahead of me. So he had found some jobs and he was kind of, you know, making plans for staying in the Pacific Northwest and I had gotten a job offer with a glaucoma specialist in downtown Seattle, and I was kind of toying around with that idea. And um, and one day, a letter came in the mail, and it was from this little tiny town, 1,500 people in North Dakota, and it said, our optometrist retired and closed his doors. Would you ever be in? We noticed that you had a North Dakota license, because we had taken boards. We noticed that you had a North Dakota license. Would you ever consider moving back to our little town and opening up a practice? So they started sending us the weekly newspaper. The local Methodist pastor drove around in the back of the plumber's pickup and did a VHS tape that dates it a little bit, a VHS tape of the town and videoed like downtown and the, you know, just drove up and down the streets and videoed the town, sent us the tape. And they, you know, started kind of talking to us a little bit about, well, you know, we don't have much space. Where could you open? Well, there's space, there's 500 square feet in the hospital. We said we'd have to have hospital privileges if we did that. They said, oh, that's not a problem. So, um, you know, what else could we do? They, they said, well, why don't you come back and why don't you look at our little town and decide if it's something that's a fit for you? And when they found out we were from the area, they flew us home over Thanksgiving. So we got to spend Thanksgiving with our families, which ironically, we're both an hour away from where we live. It's like an equilateral triangle. And so um, they flew us home to spend Thanksgiving with our families. And then they convened this luncheon and, and took us around town and showed us the hospital and showed us different spaces and what they could do with us, you know, for us and where we could open a practice and what the logistics were like and met with bankers. Um, and I'm reading the local paper. Now, mind you, it's once a week, right? 
So you can read it from front to back and read every single word. So I remember vividly having it spread out on the floor and I'm sitting on the floor and I'm reading the newspaper and I said, Mark, you got to see this. And in the bottom right hand corner was a display ad that they were raffling off a four foot stuffed raccoon to pay for the airline tickets for doctors to come and see their little town. I live where I live because of a four foot stuffed raccoon. So and the, the last and final thing was the guy who owns the home, the local paper, he's started calling our parents. So. I mean, you were, that's full on recruiting, but man, it's a different type of recruiting. I love that. Totally different. And without any guaranteed income or anything like that, you know, in hindsight, I think, what were we thinking? Um, you know, like, the, and then, you know, we have debt for two and we go to this tiny little town um, so we drove, we each drove an hour to fill in days to kind of fill in as we were trying to build this practice. Cause we opened cold literally, and, um, we're trying to figure out how to make ends meet, pay off student loans for two. And what ended up happening is three years later, there was a office 15 miles away of a private practitioner. And he decided that it was time to retire. And we made something work and we ended up buying that office. And so that's how we got the two locations. And that was easier because we walked into something that we didn't have to build from scratch. We had cash flow right away. So, but that's how we got our, our two locations. And then we quit driving other places because, you know, now we have to work on building our own practice. And, you know, fast forward, it's been over 30 years and we've got two locations and now we've got four doctors and we've got, you know, 14 employees or whatever we're at and you know I, no regrets uh, but it it was uh that, that's where we live i mean let's go way back your comfort with life in the very small town came from growing up in such a rural small town part of northwestern tucked up in northwestern minnesota yeah. just give us a sense of what life was back back there back then uh, you grew up on a farm i grew up on a farm yeah so I grew up in a grain farm. Um, and, you know, if you're familiar with farming at all, the farming goes through its its seasons where you sometimes you either get bigger or you get out. And then, it, you know, you're OK for a while. Then you get either bigger again or you get out. You know, the cost of a combine, the cost of a tractor, it, you know, I don't even know my brother farms. And so I don't even want to know what his budget is for a year because I can't even fathom it. It's far greater than our budget. I'm telling you that. Well, our budget is probably a couple of tractors. So, um, you know, it, it's just different. So I grew up on this farm and there was a point in the, uh, there was a point that my dad decided to rent out his land because he didn't want the, the, the mental, you rely on mother nature for so much. And there's so many things that are out of your control, prices, Mother Nature, you know, what's the crop going to be like? Did you get a hailstorm in the middle of the season? I mean, and that takes a mental toll on people. And it's got to be somebody who's got to be pretty um, mentally okay to to do that stuff. There, there's, it can break a person. So my dad just decided he was tired of the stress. And so he actually became a butcher. And my mom sold insurance. And so we were very, you know, and then we had this little acreage that we lived on out in the farm. And he rented out his land until my brother, my brother's 14 years older than I am. And so eventually my brother, when he graduated from college, decided to come back and he worked with a family friend because the family friend didn't have any sons to take over his farm. So between the family friend and our farm, that's how my brother started farming. And has he got you know, grown it? I'm sorry, what? Has he grown it? Oh, astronomically. Yeah. He's a pretty big farmer at this point. So, and that's why I say, I have no idea what his budget is. I can't even fathom. So it, but, feels, like, it feels like a tractor is probably a number of OCTs. Oh, <laughs> multiple OCTs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's, and you can't just have a tractor. You need all of the other stuff that you pull behind a tractor. So, and now, you, it, and those are people who are listening that might not know anything about farming. All of the tractors, combines are GPS driven. They don't even have to hold onto the steering wheel. So, I mean, the technology that's gone into our profession has gone into every other profession as well. So it's a big deal. So anyway, 
So growing up, class of forty-two, that I went. That was your high school class. Yes, and we were together from first grade. Um, kindergarten, not so much because it was split into the morning session and the afternoon session. So there was only half of us in our kindergarten class, but the rest of us at grade one to grade 12, we, there was more or less 42 of us that hung out with each other for the next 12 years. So in your upbringing, where in that uh, trajectory did you get influenced into optometry or by who? So I was the kid who needed glasses when I was eight. Um, my third grade teacher caught me sneaking in from recess. Mrs. Peterson, um, caught me sneaking in from recess to go read the board because I couldn't read the assignments on the board. And so I was up at the board reading the assignment and she was asking me why I was in from recess. And, you know, uh, we all know those stories. So next thing you know, I've got an eye appointment. Next thing you know, I've got glasses. And back in those days, my optometrist felt that if they put me into PMMA contact lenses, that maybe it would slow down my progression. So I am a former PMMA contact lens wearer as of um, age of nine. In fact, I got my contact lenses on June 3rd. So I've been wearing contact lenses for a pretty long time. And, and so I got contact lenses and, you know, you spend all this time in the office, anybody who's been in an optometrist office, you, you know, it's a yearly thing or depending upon if you're progressing or what's happening. I mean, you're very comfortable at some point by the time you graduate from high school, going to the eye doctor. And I wanted to be a biomedical engineer. My cousin had diabetes and juvenile diabetes. And I thought the absolute worst thing in the world was when I watched her get injections. Oh, like needles like why would you ever do that like how could you do that so i thought oh if we figured out how to genetically you know do something different so that these people didn't have to have shots all the time biomedical engineering was the way to get that done oh that lasted for about a semester <laughs> i realized i was not the personality to be a biomedical engineer um my son's an engineer i am not that personality so we have jokes about what do engineers do with their old clothes? They wear them. <laughs> you know, he does not like change. I, you know, I just, he's got that total engineer personality. So anyway, then I floundered for a little while. Um, I thought pharmacy, I thought, you know, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And, and there was a huge pharmacy program at the undergrad that I went to. And so I tried that for a while and I didn't really like that. And, uh, you know, I just kind of came back to, I think I went home for an eye exam and, you know, I, I'm sitting in the exam room and I'm thinking, this is pretty cool. Why don't I do this? And that's how it happened. So you ended up at Pacific University College of Optometry or an 89 grad. How did you end up choosing there? Because I didn't want to go to Chicago. <laughs> Small town girl. <laughs> no, no, the, the cab driver wouldn't take me there. Oh. So, okay, so that's another story, right? I, I've learned about myself is that you, stories are what I end up doing the most. This is the place to do it. Right. So, okay, my optometrist, both, I had two optometrists, um, one took over the other's practice, and they both graduated from Illinois. And I thought, awesome, I'm going to go to Illinois. But, you know, Chicago, it's not that far away from where I'm living in Minnesota. And so, hey, I'll go there. So I left one morning on a plane, flew into Midway Airport. Oh, first of all, I got accepted for an interview. Okay. So that was the number one thing, right? So I applied. And back in those days, there was no portal. You didn't apply to multiple schools. Um, I applied to four schools. UAB would not send me an application because I was from the wrong part of the country. And they know that, but it was just what they did at the time. And I thought, well, wouldn't that be kind of cool to live in Alabama? But um, it wasn't going to happen. And I applied to SACO. They accepted me for an interview. I applied to Illinois. They accepted me for an interview. And Pacific also accepted me for an interview. So my first one, because I'm going to Illinois, right? So I'm going to fly to Illinois. So I flew down one morning, got into Midway Airport, got into the cab. And back in those days, it was an Impala that didn't have the partitions. And I said, 3241 South Michigan Avenue. And the cab driver put his cab in park. And he leans over the back seat and looks at me and he says, what do you want to go down there for? And I said, 
Now remember, I'm a 21 year old redhead, blondish redhead. So I said, I have an interview. And he said, for what? A school? What kind of school? So I had to tell him this whole story that I got accepted to an optometry school that had, you know, was down on Michigan Avenue. All right, well, I'll take you there, but you don't belong there. So he proceeds to drive me to the school. And the entire trip to the school, if Illinois could control their cab drivers, I probably would have been in Illinois. But the entire trip to the school, he proceeded to tell me that he was going to stop at the curb, that he was going to wait for me at the curb, wait for me to get into the building. And then when I called, he asked me what my plans were for leaving that day. So he said, well, when you call your cab to leave, you stay in the building until the cab stops at the curb. And then you walk across, the, you know, down to where the cab's at. So by that time, I'm thinking, what the heck am I getting into? And there was razor wire around the school. You went to Illinois. And so I mean, in, in the 1980s, it was definitely, you know, near some of the parts of the city that were, you know, underserved. And um, it but was you had a great clinic experiences, place. right? So, I mean, there's pros and cons with all of that because you had these awesome clinic experiences. But anyway, so then I asked where you could eat and, and I started asking questions and it wasn't about the school as much as it was more about the lifestyle of living there. And so they accepted me and I declined. Fast forward, when I was AOA president, they asked me to speak at their graduation and they gave me an honorary degree. So I, I finally got to graduate from Illinois anyway. So, and I, I joked with them when I, they gave me that degree, but so I went to Pacific side unseen because I didn't have money to fly around and mm -hmm. Pacific actually came to my undergrad and conducted interviews where I lived. So, and I'd saw pictures and, you know, talked to some people on the phone and there was no videos back then, you know, it was just a different time. Right. So it was a little nerve wracking because of the fact that I went there sight unseen, but I, you know, I figured, well, it's going to be a place that has a good reputation, seems like um, it'd be a wonderful place to live, which it is. It's gorgeous out there. And for somebody from a really small town, it was a nice fit for me. I'm glad it worked out. Yeah. As you went through your practice career, you started, you know, at local and state volunteerism. It became just embedded in you. You have an incredible commitment to volunteerism. Who got you started? Um. Well, you know, in school, you, you you do stuff in your high school, right? And so there's just the little mundane things. But probably the biggest volunteer project that I ever did was I started getting active in the American Cancer Society. Hmm. Our county that I grew up in had a pretty active chapter. And I had a, I played basketball. And my basketball teammate that was a year older than me ended up getting diagnosed with cancer and she passed away at the age of 19. So myself and another teammate decided that we needed to do something for maybe this was appropriate for the American Cancer Society. And there was kind of a niche uh, that might, you know, how could we raise money to help for this effort? And so we started Laura's Run. And I think, I, I'm not 100% sure on this, but it went for 20 plus years. And it, it, it was every June. And, you know, we, we ran it for the number of years while we lived in the area. And then obviously when I went up to, to optometry school, I was no longer part of it, but they, the community kept it going and somebody else stepped up to keep the whole operation going. And I think they raised over $350,000 over the course of the run of doing this run. So that was my first kind of little forte into organizing and doing something in a volunteer capacity. Um, there was run that was done in memory of somebody else. And cause I had that experience about how to run a run. Um, I helped with one at, while I was a student at Pacific and, you know, it's just kind of one of those things that it was, um, I, I guess I've always been of that mentality about giving back and how can we make a difference in life? So it, that's part of just who I am. It's just part of the genetics. Well, I know you, are very committed to servant leadership. And as I mentioned earlier, you demonstrated that all the way up to becoming president of the AOA. Was that in 2011? Yes. Um, what or who motivated you on the journey toward optometry volunteers of state, regional, national? So we opened cold. 
We had no clue how to bill insurance. A big part of making some money is knowing how to bill insurance. And so we went to the state association and some local folks, and they were so wonderful. I mean, they, out of the goodness of their heart, they taught us how to bill. And, and you know, billing insurance is somewhat local, too. I mean, what applies to California does not necessarily apply to North Dakota or Wisconsin. So, you know, there's caveats with the insurers that are in the regions. So there was local people that taught us, took us under the wings and said, this is the best way to bill insurance. This is how you do it, how you code it. And we were up and running and doing it. And it had, had somebody that we could ask, which was really wonderful. I went to the state association meeting and said, thank you for your help. Uh, if you ever need any help in return, just ask. Be careful what you say. Because <laughs> the next thing you know, I'm on a committee for the association. And, and you know, just kind of one thing leads to another. And, 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 and all of our state associations, by and large, they're looking for somebody who can help just take the banner and, and wave the banner for a time period for the association board. And you will never regret doing it because you always learn more about yourself by doing something like that. So I served and then there was a classmate of mine that served behind me on the association board. And then Mark, my husband served two years after me. And so he became president of our state association two years after I was president and hence the reason why I mentioned at the very beginning that my son went to his very first board meeting when he was five weeks old. And then you represent your state. And so now you go to national meetings because now you're representing your state. And then you start talking and networking with people. And then people say, hey, would you like to serve on such and such a committee for the AOA? Well, okay, sure. Okay. So you start serving on another committee and another committee and and before we started taping, you and I were both talking about Pat Cummings and Vic Connors, who have both since passed away. And I remember being at a membership meeting for AOA because I was a membership committee chair at the time. And they stuck me, literally stuck me in the corner of a banquet room. And they're tall. So they're taller than me. And I'm in the corner and they're looking down at me and they're saying, Dory, you should run for the AOA board. And that's kind of how it started. Uh, that, I did not know that story. I love that story. There are a lot of us that were pinned into the corner by those two people to participate in things. Mm -hmm. and, and and what is it about serving? If you were, there were a number of firsts for you as president of the AOA. You were first president from North Dakota? Yep. Yes. First female president in North Dakota, first president from North Dakota. I guess first female president of the AOA. Yeah. Those, I mean, these are, are big issues, and, and those doctors understood the value and the power of your efforts. When you get to be president, you've done a lot of your work, to your point, through committee work and being on the AOA Board of Trustees. And so as pre pre president, you're presiding over a lot of things. But what was that like? What does the audience not know about these folks who, who do the ultimate volunteerism and get to the point of being president of AOA? Thank them the next time you see them. Because it's a decade of their life. I, I mean, that's the easiest way to put it. It is a decade of your life. And it's the conference calls. It's the emails. It's the, you know, nowadays it would be the webinars more. It would be the Zoom calls. It would be the travel. Uh, you know, they said to me, oh, it'll be 90 days of travel. That's that's it. Oh, that's a lie. Um, it's more than that. Because if you look at the mandatory things, but there's always the other stuff that comes up. So it, it's a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of dedication. And, you know, I'm going to be, I try to be as authentic as possible. And I remember sitting, so Don Kaufman was from South Dakota. Okay. I talked to Don before I ran for the NDA or for the AOA board because somebody from a little state and, you know, back in those days when Don was on the board, everything was by paper and snail mail. I can't even imagine trying to conduct business that way. But that's what they did. And so I talked to Don and, you know, I did a lot of soul searching and such and decided that this is what I was going to do. And Mark was very supportive of me and I had little kids. In fact, I used to lie about their ages a little bit or stretch their ages a little bit because people would say, well, you know, literally, aren't you supposed to be home with your kids? Um, so, it, you know, just some of the things that people say. But it, it's you learn a lot about yourself 
And I'm a very different person than I was the day that I went to ICO for that interview. You know, the confidence, the just knowing what you really believe, knowing how to public speak. I was terrified of public speaking and now I rather enjoy it, but I do it in my way of doing it. Um, you know, there's just so many things that you learn about yourself and about our communities. And I, I say that, that I never went to a meeting that I didn't come back with something that enhanced my practice here in North Dakota. You know, it's interesting. One of your points of pride as AOA president was a visit you made to every school and college of optometry. Mm -hmm. And we talked about how things are different. You're different. What did you learn about the profession and, and particularly education through that process, which is now, you know, well over 10 years ago? That was so much fun. It was a ton of work and fatiguing, but it was so much fun. And that's where I kind of got my little motivational speaker kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. It was because I gave the same talk to 20 different times, basically. Nuances, but it, it was um, life's little lessons for optometry. And so I spoke to every single group of students and made this fun little talk about why optometry is so wonderful, why it's so great, what we love about optometry, what, what we love about learning, and why you need to be involved in our profession. Okay, so that was the impetus of it. So this kind of little motivational speech that I, I did or talk that I did with students in interactive fashion to some extent. I also sat down with every dean or college president of every school and had some time with them. And I sat down with all of the faculty at every time. Usually it was a breakfast or a lunch or something. And I learned about the motivational speaking part of things. I learned how to connect better with audiences because you get to practice the same thing over and over again. Um, I learned so many things by, by listening to the leadership of the schools. And, and actually, I am far more attuned to the budgeting of a, an optometry school, what it takes you know, the most expensive portion is the clinic portion. I have a whole perspective that I would have never gotten if I hadn't sat down with 20 leaders and heard what keeps them up at night. Okay. Yeah. And then the faculty. If there was one thing that I learned that was an amazing aha moment for me, sometimes the faculty weren't always very friendly to AOA. And so sometimes those those conversations could be rather tough, pointed. Some some schools were much better than others. And so there, there was some pushback from, you know, people hated infancy. I mean, it was just weird things that happened. And you're like, okay. Oh, and board certification was going on. Don't forget that. So you were dealing with all of these different things that the faculty were upset about because they live in their world, too. I learned that if I stood in front of them, the conversation was horrible. I was lecturing to them. If I sat down and talked to them, the conversation was much more communicative, much more free-flowing, much less aggressive, if that's the word to use. But it was now I was an equal with them instead of somebody who is lecturing because they lecture all the time it would that apart so stacy um from aoa traveled around with me to every single school and we would get done and i'd say why was that conversation so difficult and we started paying attention to what what happened and then i got set in this place where it was a breakfast thing and it was round tables and that conversation went so much better and so we started paying attention and, and then I started paying attention to body language. And if I got put into an auditorium, because invariably that was the space they had for this to happen. If I got put into an auditorium and I started out standing because of the auditorium and you started reading and paying attention to body language, I would come from behind the lectern and I'd go and I'd sit on the desk in the front row. And the conversation changed. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it really is. There's so much to be learned from that. Yeah, it, it was, that was like, you know, the other stuff was really cool, but the body language and reading people has nothing to do with optometry, but I've used it a ton since then. Well, you went on in 2020, you ended up getting a degree, a master's of arts in leadership. 
this had to be the motivation to take that to the next level. It, it was. So I got done with the AOA board and I thought, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do? Like, just go home and see patients? And I told Mark before that just. I was done with the AOA board that I'm. I, there's no way I can go back to five days of patient care. Just it's not going to happen. Okay, so don't expect me to just go back and not travel and not do something because I will. I'm going to have problems. And he just laughs and he goes, "Okay." So I, I was really blessed and grateful because I met so many people that people asked me to do different things. I sat on advisory boards for pharma boards. Um, I, you know, somebody asked me to do some lecturing on glaucoma. Okay. So I, I did that. I, I, you know, there was a bunch of different things that I did, but I started paying attention to the things that I said yes to. And I always did my best at it. So I, I mean, I wasn't trying to like not do something well. Okay. Glaucoma lecturing is not my forte. Okay. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Can I do it? Yes. Am I really awesome at it? No. Um, but I started paying attention to the things that got me like, what was driving the juices? And it was that motivational thing that I did with the students and how can you inspire people to make differences? How can you inspire, you know, when I think about it off the top of my head, I'm back at the American Cancer Society. How can I inspire change? Like, and, and I just, okay, that's something that I really love doing. And that when I did it and when I was done, it was like, yes, this feels really good. And this was really fun. And I had fun doing it. And so I started lecturing about leadership topics and about how to make a difference. And, and again, I, I had people who I knew and I had met and gave me an opportunity in a forum. And so I created content. And then I thought, well, hey, I'm talking to you guys and I have the exact same degree as you. Maybe, okay, I learned leadership baptism by fire because I was on the AOA board. So I have that, but I still have the same degree as you. So you keep your ears open. And I found out about a hybrid program that was in North Dakota, that part of it was in person on Saturdays, part of it was online. And so I ended up going back to school and I got my master's in leadership. I had a ball. I just, it was so much fun. And so both Seth, Ian and myself were all in college at the same time. So I was a 2020 grad and my boys are so funny. My oldest son is like, mom, that is so awesome that you're going back to school. I think that's really great. And my younger son is like, why on earth would you ever want to go back to school? Oh my gosh. So we kind of had some laughs about that. That's awesome. I mean, on top of all this, you and your husband have this multi-location practice. You recently did a huge renovation uh, at a time where I think a lot of our colleagues are slowing down a bit. Um, you've gotten this degree, you're, you're expanding your clinic. Why are you pushing yourself like that? Because I'm not ready to be done. I love what I do. And, you know, it, here's the other part of it. Several years ago, I was facilitating a conversation. Um, actually, it was a group of practitioners. And the topic that I was assigned to facilitate was how to find an associate doc or somebody to buy into your practice. Okay. <clears throat> here's my body language comment that I'm learning that, okay, I read the room and I, I'm looking around this room and it's primarily men and they're primarily in their sixties and they're wanting to know, like, how do I find somebody to buy my practice? And some of them are in rural places. How, how do you get somebody to come back to those places? And this was 10 years ago. And I said to Mark, I came home from that meeting and I said, I do not want to be one of those people or, or they've, they've led, I've seen it in my community in North Dakota that they've done nothing to their practice in 20 years. It looks, you walk into it, and it looks like it's 1980 in their practice or worse, 1970s. Um, but you know, it's the mob and the paint, you know, the, or the hunter green or the mob frame boards or, you know, just, they haven't done anything. And so I just said to Mark, I don't want to be one of those people. I want us to have a thriving practice that we actually have something that's worth selling in the time that we're done. And, and a, not just selling, but something that somebody wants to come to that's attractive. So seven years ago, we moved out of a location here, a block away from where I'm sitting. That's why I'm doing this. Um, we had an office that was a block away from our house. Uh, 1,900 square feet. So seven 
years ago, we found out that there was a funeral home that had closed and it was sitting there and the owner wanted to sell it. And so we went into a 3,100 square foot space expanded and it's a square. So it was perfect. So we set up this circular pattern office. I mean, it is like, we just, I love going to work there because it's, it, it's just so wonderful. And, and we have more space for staff and, you know, yes, this 1900 square foot building was good enough, but I didn't want to be good enough. And when we were in there, we had one room that was 11 by 13 and we had a visual field unit in that room. It was the only thing in the room. By the time we moved out, we had a visual field, an OCT, an OPD auto refractor. Oh, and an Optos. Four things in this little 11 by 13 room that got hotter than blazes because of all the computers that were in there. Was it good enough? Yeah, it was. But I don't want to be good enough. I want to be great. So we moved into that space seven years ago. and. The other location was an, a funny L-shaped. We, in, we owned that building also, and it was 4,000 square feet, but structural walls that we had to deal with. And so for the time being, we made it so it was this funny L-shaped office where the smallest part of the L was the front. So the waiting room, the optical was just crammed. And we finally bit the bullet, went through the structural walls twice, and, you know, the beams that you have to do. I mean, it's a big deal. And we expanded. So our optical waiting room front desk area is twice the size of what it was before. And we did that in 2023. We were closed for seven weeks in that location. And I'm searching for a number. Now I'm going to try and remember. I think we were only down 2% for the year. Mm -hmm despite being closed for seven weeks in that location. So people came back and they were just were waiting for us. And we had a really great year and people are commenting about it. In fact, we're having a grand opening for that office um, in a couple of weeks. It, things just took longer because of COVID. I mean, I waited forever for wallpaper. And, and one of the best things is that you probably don't have to auction off a a stuffed pheasant to bring in new doctors in the future. Exactly. Exactly. When I asked you in a pre-interview question, what you would describe as the largest threat to optometry, optometry in say the next five years, you gave a single word. You said apathy. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what you mean by that? I, I've said for many, 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 many years before I was on the AOA board, there's so many practices that have, survived in spite of themselves. And so, and you look at what's happening, you know, go on the social media forums and, and just read what's going on in people's offices and, you know, how they don't belong to the AOA, how they really don't care, how they, um, you know, and then they complain about optometry or they're, they're bored with optometry. Well, I would in some practice settings, I would probably slit my wrists too, if I was doing the exact same thing over and over again. Depends upon what motivates you, right? So if you just want something that is a job that you just go in and, and just see some patients and go home and don't think about what you're doing and really care, there's where I come from, the apathy. There, it, AOA first look on Monday, I think it was, had a news blurb that said, Practices with OCTs refer more people. Now I have to paraphrase. It was like, basically they're referring people out for glaucoma. They have an OCT. And I forwarded it to a friend of mine and I said, why aren't we treating glaucoma? Like all of us come out treating glaucoma. We, this is part of our education. Why are you referring out? You have an OCT. Why are you referring glaucoma out? So why aren't we using our education? If you talk to pharmaceutical companies, they'll tell you that 20% of the ODs prescribe 80% of the medications. Really? Um, I spent a bunch of money on my education. I And they're spending even more now. So why aren't we using our education to our fullest capacity? Why are we apathetic about the fact that we let government tell us that we're just optometrists? Why do we let vision plans not... Re increase our reimbursements since the late 90s? Why do we sign up for 
something that's going to pay us $20 an eye exam. I, I could go on. <laughs> and, and I think it comes down to one word is apathy. And to put the positive on it, you know, opportunity comes from uh, the, the taking advantage of, you know, eye care is health care. It always has been. Always. And, and, and we're not in a better position than any pro other health profession today, are we? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I think about this. So I'll talk to you about how we're growing and replacing us because I we're doing something actively about that. But so I have a college student that's been with us for three years now. This is his third summer. Well, I'll go there because it fits with the conversation. So who's going to come to Park River, North Dakota and buy out our practice? Nobody from Texas, nobody from California, nobody from Florida. So we have to figure out how we're going to recreate us. Several years ago, we have a partner with us and she was a summer intern for us. She was a college student, said she was interested in optometry and we brought her in. She worked in our office and lo and behold, she's now one of our partners. She came back. She married a farmer and they have land. You can't move land. So she's stuck in the area and we brought her in. She's our partner, which is, she's awesome. And, and, you know, it's a wonderful thing, right? To have this partner with us now. So the three of us have sat down and said, okay, what do we do? What's the future? Like, do you, you know, you can't run two locations with one dock. That's just not going to happen. So for the last several years, we have hired a college student. If they've come in as a patient and said they were interested in optometry, we've immediately hired them as a summer intern when they're in college. We have two young women that are in their fourth year of optometry school as we speak. that are from the area. Uh, so, and I, one says she's coming back for sure. I'm not sure about the other, but one for sure says she's coming back. In fact, she started dating somebody who's local recently. So we're crossing our fingers. We have um, two people that have applied and are accepted into optometry school to start next, this fall in 24. And we have this young man who's been with us um, now for this third summer. He's taking his oat test this summer and he intends to apply with the hope of getting in the fall of 25. And, you know, he's been in our practice for three summers. He knows our culture. He knows. So out of all of these five, we're hoping that somebody ends up coming back and is being our replacement. And I, I think this young man who's been with us on Monday our, our practice is so rural that we just deal with so many things and we're so medical. Uh, and yes, we've got an older population, but case in point, four people on Monday morning, Monday and Monday afternoon, got something in their eye. And so they're in the office. So you start out with your schedule, but then it happens because we're the emergency department. Even the hospital just says, go to Heartland. You know, don't, don't come here. Just go to Heartland. So in the afternoon, we get this phone call. Somebody comes in and he's been ripping composite decking on a table saw, pulls back, trunk falls off, nails him in the right eye. And, you know, I think I got something in my eye. Well, he had a lacerated cornea and you're looking at it and like, this is just another day at Heartland Eye Care. And I'm looking at it thinking too, I think he has an interocular foreign body, which would not be my first person that I've seen with that either. Cause those come in on a periodic basis, you know, at least once every summer or every other summer. We've got somebody who's got something that's back in the retina. And so that was what I was worried about. So now the hyphema is forming as I'm watching. And so my student is with me and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm coaxing him and, and showing him what's going on here. Just another day at Heartland Eye Care in rural America. Well, you've been very intentional to the degree you can be placing these bets, you know, showing these young people the opportunity but you live it. You and Mark live it. You demonstrate it. And, and you have such joy in providing eye care. Uh, I, I, I almost feel like your story is the prototype of why optometry should be something, you know, all these young folks that are getting into the profession should, should yearn to take to the, to the greatest degree that the profession can because your community depends on you so much. And they're so loyal. You know, everybody wants to live in urban places where there's somebody down every single block. And I, I, I can't not express enough how I believe that rural optometry is the most altruistic form of optometry because I deal with infants. And this week I had a hundred year old. So my oldest patient, I think is 103. 
So, and the gamut that runs in between and the, the, the disease that I see on a daily basis and the fact that these people are so loyal and so happy that we're in the community. Yes, they can drive. You're not sick to go have an eye exam. People drive an hour to go out for dinner around here. So that's not a big deal. They go, they can go to the Walmarts and the targets and all the places that they want to go whenever that's because they make, they go to Lowe's when they're there and they do other errands when they go have their eye exam. So it's not like we don't have competition because we do. You have to remember, we drive an hour to go out for dinner. We don't think anything about it. So, but by and large, the community is so positive about the fact that they have health professionals that are in the area that it's just people thank you. And and what's not to love about that? Yeah. So as a person who says the best way to teach is tell stories and you tell stories well, tell us a story that even your closest friends in optometry don't know about you. Something you like, something you dislike, some experience you've had in your life. Give us a give us a story about something that nobody else would know until they hear it here. Oh, good question. Because I've been pretty open and transparent. Um, That's a good point. <laughs> I uh, okay. My first form of transportation for many years was a Honda. Honda I would drive a motorcycle. Right? Yeah, I mean, not a big motorcycle, but you know, I. I that's how I got around. In fact, so I didn't have a driver's license. And my first job was roguing sunflowers. You walk up and down sunflower fields. This job doesn't exist anymore. It's been replaced by mechanization. So, but you walk up and down sunflower fields and you actually, that are meant to be for seed purposes. And you rip out the diseased sunflowers. It's all on the wrist. You, you know, you rip out the sunflower, you put them face down so the bees don't, pollinate the sunflower. Yeah. So there's a whole process to this. That was my very first job. I did not have a license, a driver's license, and I had to get to my job. So I had a Trail 90 motorcycle and I was known to go a lot of places with my Trail 90 motorcycle. My mom sold insurance and the sheriff came in one day and said, um, my mom asked, you know, if somebody had a job and they needed to get to that job, you know, and they're taking back roads to get to that job, would they be in a lot of trouble? And the sheriff actually told my mom, well, if she happens to have red hair and she's going to, you know, on her motorcycle to her job, we'll probably leave her alone. They were already watching. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, right? So, um, yeah. All right. Let's finish with this. Be the motivator. Tell us what's inspiring about being an optometrist. You've given us, right, the sense of value, but motivate us. I love being an optometrist because it allows me to make a difference in people's lives. And if you've learned anything about anything I've said today, for whatever reason, in my genetics or something, it's about making a difference and making the world a better place. Can we deal with more positivity and less negativity in life? Because if we all have a little gratitude and a positive attitude, I think we can all make the world a little better. And so I, I love optometry because you're making a difference. Think of all the people that you've given glasses to or that you referred because they had glaucoma and they're going blind or, you know, or whatever. And people, their most precious sense that they worry about is their vision. We're in that position to make a difference. What's your... Uh Last point, what's your greatest pride of your career so far? Of my career? Mm -hmm. Of your optometry career? Probably being AOA president. Hmm. Yeah. Probably. To the point you made earlier, thank you for having done that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, that's it. Dr. Dory Carlson, thank you for giving us a chance to learn about your many amazing journeys through this Sandbox Stories episode. Thank you. And to the audience, that's it for today's Sandbox Stories. Until our next Sandbox Stories episode, be great.